The saying goes, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. But what if you don't have access to fresh produce where you live? Or transportation to the doctor if that apple doesn't work? Or someone to watch your kids while you're at the doctor? Or you get the point. A person's success in managing their health and wellness may depend much less on what happens inside of a doctor's office than what happens outside of it. There's plenty about where we are born, grow, live, and work, and how these circumstances are shaped by access to resources that influence the health we can achieve. There's a name for it, social determinants of health. So as a community, how might we begin to address these social determinants? How might we make progress towards reducing health disparities and improving health equity? How do we create a future where people receive support to stay well, rather than just treating them when they are sick? It starts with research. It starts with conversations. It starts with listening. It starts with understanding. Supporting people in their journey to good health is part of how we can create a better world. I'm Ellen Beckjord. Good Health, Better World is a show about how stronger communities begin with good health for everyone, even outside the doctor's office. In episode eight, we hear from Kate Berry, Senior Vice President for Clinical Innovation at America's Health Insurance Plans, commonly known as AHIP, and Diane Holder, Executive Vice President of UPMC Insurance Services Division and President and CEO of UPMC Health Plan. Kate Berry, thank you so much for joining this episode of the Good Health, Better World podcast. Kate Berry is Senior Vice President of Clinical Affairs and Strategic Partnerships with America's Health Insurance Plans, or AHIP, in Washington, D.C. Kate, welcome to Good Health, Better World. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you so much for having me. Well, we really appreciate your time. Just to begin, would you tell our listeners a little bit about AHIP and about your background that led you to the role you have there now? I'd be happy to. Um, I've been with America's Health Insurance Plans, or AHIP, for six years. I've worked in healthcare my whole career um, from a lot of different directions. And right before coming to uh, AHIP, I was CEO of a public-private partnership that focused on the adoption and use of health information technology to engage patients and improve health outcomes. I actually joined AHIP because um, health insurers really have a major impact on protecting and improving population health. Uh, AHIP, AHIP represents the uh, health insurance industry all types of health insurers, including integrated provider health plan organizations, national plans, local and regional plans, all of which cut across Medicaid managed care, Medicare Advantage, employer sponsored and uh, commercial plans. So we are really focused on delivering affordable access to quality health care. Could you say a little bit more about that, about the role of the payer and, and, and what you think some of the real key contributions that can be made from this part of the system are? Well, when I started my career in healthcare, you know, people weren't really talking about the social determinants of health or health disparities, um, which is not to say those things didn't exist at that point. And these um, determinants really play a significant role in a person's ability to make healthy, healthy choices, to access quality health care, and to live a healthy life. And as you said, um, you know, health insurers have a really important role to play um, in addressing whole person care, if you will. And that includes really thinking about physical, behavioral, and social needs, all of which really direct, um, have a direct impact on a person's health and well being. And with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, it has really further highlighted the importance of behavioral health needs. Um, you know, we know that all Americans are experiencing much more anxiety, depression, and stress. Um, you know, all those things are really um, also affecting, you know, people's fear of illness, potentially the grief of losing loved ones. Um, the economic impact on businesses, communities, and individuals, and all the uncertainty 
around all of this. So um, health insurers, of course, can play a really important role um, to promote prevention and wellness, to address the social determinants of health, and really, as I mentioned, focusing on whole person care. So in addition to covering traditional health services, um, our health insurance provider members are um, implementing programs that address food insecurity, um, to address unstable or unaffordable housing, um, to help engage people who may be um, socially isolated. Um, they provide transportation services to help people get to the doctor or the pharmacy, for example. One of the themes that I think has come up in almost or maybe every episode of this podcast is the theme of partnerships. Could you talk a little bit about how you think about positioning public-private partnerships for success? Well, health, uh, health insurance plans often partner with community-based organizations to um, help support people's social needs and so sometimes just um, establishing trust and uh, building relationships and understanding um, the capacity of those community-based organizations and um, health insurers are indeed investing in helping to build the capacity of community-based organizations. I would also say that the ability to um, have the information in place that can um, be shared between both the health insurance plan who may have case managers talking to the people they serve and um, getting an understanding of the needs that may they may have. And sometimes the plan may have their own programs that they bring people into, but they may also partner with community-based organizations and refer people for services. And so it's important to know, did the person actually receive the services that they needed? And um, did it have an impact on their health and well-being? So to be able to have that information um, flowing back and forth between the health plans and the community-based organizations um, is an important aspect of the partnership as well. The theme of this episode is, you know, looking forward, where are we headed with respect to social determinants of health? But it does raise a question regarding technology. There's been a pretty big expansion in the use of telehealth, but we know that that expansion has not been equitable. Curious about how technology can be used to promote equity, to address social determinants. And you think that there are some um, things that we should really be looking out for to make sure that technology, in fact, does advance us towards more equity and doesn't, in, in unintended ways, potentially exacerbate health disparities? That is such a great question. Um, I mean, telehealth has been so important um, to ensuring access to care for people during the pandemic. Going forward, we would see telehealth becoming an integrated part of healthcare delivery in the future. Um, but you're exactly right that um, it's not necessarily equally available to everyone because there's no question that affordable internet isn't available everywhere. So that can indeed exacerbate health disparities if underserved communities don't necessarily have access um, to telehealth. At the same time, though, um, most people have a phone. That has been um, another aspect where, you know, people can actually have a, a phone consultation with their provider, um, if not a video consultation. So, so that's one way to at least help with that. And we've heard anecdotally, too, that even for potential, you know, underserved communities who may actually have access to video visits, that it's been helpful to providers to have kind of that view into a person's home um, so they may have additional visibility into some of their needs. So my, um, my career really started back in about 2005, 2006. And, and at that time, I, that was really when I started working on initiatives related to digital health and 
talking a lot at that time about the digital divide. And back then, the digital divide was really about hardware, you know, who had a smartphone and, and who didn't. I'd love to know your opinion. Represents one of the biggest obstacles with respect to the remaining digital divide, which is this broadband access. But do you think there's enough attention being paid right now to broadband as a social determinant, if you will, related to enabling people to use technology to access healthcare? I think there's um, there's certainly some attention to that at the federal level. I participated in a um, task force on telehealth that was convened by the American Telemedicine Association, as well as the um, National Quality um, NCQA, the National Committee on Quality Assurance, and um, an alliance on uh, connected health. And um, you know, and that group came up with sort of policy recommendations around the use of telehealth and really did acknowledge in that report that there needs to be continued investment um, in, in, you know, making um, broadband more widely available. Um, so I think there's awareness and there are programs to address that, but it, I think it's going to continue to be a challenge. We're always sort of redefining what a digital native really is because of the digital assets that are available. But so many expectations that change and opportunities that arise uh, in, in the context of technology. And so appreciate hearing a little bit about how AHIP is working with health plans on those topics, because as I listen to you talk, you know, it sort of strikes me that there are three things, right? These, these things often almost always end up being more nuanced, maybe than originally anticipated, right? There are no technology-based silver bullets. There are really very few silver bullets, if any, in, in healthcare. There's always some kind of nuance about figuring out, you know, what's the best use case and for whom? How do we really figure out how to make this work best in which instances and for whom? It, it sounds like AHIP is engaged with health plans on those issues as they relate to telehealth and would love to hear about other ways AHIP is bringing together um, health plans and, and working on, on some of the, the big issues that we're facing in health and healthcare. Yeah, well, so one of our major um, initiatives that we have underway actually is what we call Project Link which is our um, major initiative around addressing the social determinants of health. So with Project Link, we have a number of resources that we've developed that we um, use to engage with stakeholders, policymakers, and others to sort of help them understand, you know, why um, the social determinants of health are so important to health insurers. And we also, as part of Project Link, um, convene our members, our health plan members, to discuss um, some of their best practices and innovative programs around um, addressing the social determinants, and also to identify some of the shared challenges that they're all um, facing and try to come up with um, ways to address those challenges. And then, of course, because we're a trade association, we work hard to develop um, policy recommendations and advocacy strategies that really, um, you know, have a broader way of addressing the social determinants of health. Building capacity of community-based organizations is one of those things that we advocate for because they are such critical partners. Are there any aspects of, of that work or that initiative that you care to discuss in more detail or anything that you're especially excited about or hopeful about right now? Well, we're, um, you know, we're very excited about the work that our members are doing and some of the really innovative approaches that they're taking. So things like connecting people with um, training programs and, and building a network with employers. We have some plans in communities that are basically converting a bus to a food pantry <laughs> and, um, you know, and driving around um, to underserved communities to deliver fresh and healthy food, for example. And that can really 
have an incredible impact on uh, people's health, keeping them out of the hospital, helping them have access to primary care, behavioral care, um, et cetera. So those are just a couple examples that we're really um, excited about. Oh, that's fantastic. And and certainly excited about that here too. We had a whole episode that we devoted to workforce development, also devoted an episode to housing. And, you know, I think you're speaking to the idea that um, health plans around the country are, are moving beyond paying for healthcare claims, right? That may still be what lots of folks think of first when they think about an insurer, um, but in recognition of the fact that these social determinants are really what drive the majority of health outcomes that that payers as an entity that are interested in supporting um, and preserving the health of the populations that they insure and care for are making big investments in initiatives that address these foundational drivers of health. How long would you say that's been going on? Has that been a shift that you've observed even in your time at AHIP or over the course of your career? Well, I think the level of attention on the social determinants has really increased in the last, I'm going to say, five years. Um, I don't necessarily think it's new to health plans, however. I do think that um, for many years, um, you know, Medicaid managed care and, um, you know, in particular is an area where I think there's been a focus on whole person care, which includes um, addressing people's social needs. I think especially as we talk with our um, our health plan members, at, you know, they will say this is this is not new for us. <laughs> Um, but I think that the, you know, the the recognition that um, there's really no one stakeholder who can address all of these needs. And so I think, um, you know, certainly in the last five years, we've seen many organizations, um, you know, really increase their um, focus in these areas. And I think we know, too, that it's going to need to be a collaboration, right? It's going to need to be public sector, private sector, um, you know, health plan, um, provider organizations, um, community-based organizations. There's really not one stakeholder who can address all of these needs. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the kinds of things that you're looking for as evidence of progress or the things you think that we should be watching as measures of progress or success? These are really challenging and longstanding issues. You know, a couple things in terms of, you know, measuring and thinking about what, what success can look like. And I do think collaboration is key, um, you know, and I think having trusted partnerships. And then I think really, um, you know, having proactive efforts to understand what people's needs are and to design program and whether those needs are, you know, food or housing or job training, you know, um, transportation, et cetera, addressing social isolation um, and, and, tr and working to design programs that are indeed effective in, you know, addressing the most important needs that people have and, that means it is about engaging people and the people need to be, you know, trust the system also, whoever is reaching out to them. I think that, you know, trust, um, understanding the needs, having programs that actually work. Um, and in order to know if it works or not, <laughs> we need to have a way to um, measure the impact. I think that collaboration around measurement even <laughs> is something, um, you know, that w is important to the success as well. Kate Berry, I want to thank you so much for being on this episode of the Good Health, Better World podcast. It's been such a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. And if anyone listening would like to learn more about America's health insurance plans and the excellent work happening at AHIP, you can visit the episode show notes where we'll have links to AHIP and other things that we talked about. Well, 
Well, it's really my great pleasure to welcome Diane Holder to the Good Health, Better World podcast. Diane is the CEO of UPMC Health Plan and Executive Vice President at UPMC. UPMC Health Plan serves ne- nearly 4 million members, and Diane is a leading expert in healthcare delivery and financing. She's held numerous senior executive positions in the industry, and Diane began her career in mental health service delivery specializing in program development and health and hospital administration. Diane has a special interest in efforts that support vulnerable populations. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Oh, thank you, Ellen. I'm really delighted to be here. This is a podcast where we've talked about lots of different aspects of what many folks call social determinants of health. So I wanted to start there and ask how you would define that term and what comes to mind in the realm of social determinants of health? So as we know, social determinants of health uh, is a term that is getting a lot of use right now. Um, I think it's something that pre the pandemic was certainly underway as sort of general understanding grows, that there are many, many things that influence your health outside of the doctors you see and the uh, medicines you take, uh, DNA that you have, Um, and the genetic predispositions. There are many other things that really do influence how healthy we are. And one of the terms I think that people have started to look at is the social determinants of health. And I think by that, what I see is what are all those things that actually are um, part of, of shaping you. Where do you live? Do you have grocery stores nearby? Are there any sidewalks? Can you take a walk? And we know it's not equitable in this world. Let's talk for a minute about the word determinant. And I think that that word speaks to the degree to which these factors have such a significant influence on health and health outcomes. But you've argued that it might be more appropriate to use the word influencer. Can you say a little bit about the distinction between determinants of health versus influencers of health? As this whole literature is evolving, one of the things that that concerns me a little is that we're concretizing this as a set of determinants, which to me almost have a fait accompli quality to the definition. I don't think that's what people mean, but it, but that connotation to me is potential. And so when I've been thinking about this whole area, and I've thought about it for a long time, you know, my training actually is in psychology and social work and public health. And when I think of um, determinants versus influencers, I think, well, modifiable risk is is something that I see in the domain of influence. It's your attitude that can influence how you behave or what you do. Uh, It's the policies that surround you that can influence at a societal level what happens. I think one of the things that that I'm cautious about, however, is that we also don't want to get into a place where um, we think that it's all about pulling up your bootstraps. When I think about social influencers, social determinants, is I think about what are those levels of things that can that can influence our outcome. And for me, the stress literature has a tremendous um, opportunity to help us think about social influencers or determinants. We know that the impact of stress is tremendous. We know that it not only can change your biological processes like your immune system. Um, but it also can change your mood. When I think about chronic stress, it is not a surprise that those kinds of chronic stressors that come from poverty, discrimination, um, inability to have a stable job, um, living with a chronic condition, all of these kinds of influencers or conditions uh, become very determinant or influential. And when you talked about the degree to which we need to be mindful of understanding where the right leverage points are, it made me think about the role that you think payers have in addressing social determinants. 
Well, I think payers can have a, a fairly major role, but I think it's in partnership uh, with others. I think one of the advantages that, that when I look through the lens of a payer is the opportunity to look at broad populations. I see an opportunity to see and notice differences in terms of what happens in a given neighborhood where a large group of our members might live. And I think one of the things that, looking through the lens of a payer that actually has a public health orientation, which I think is an important um, qualifier, I think you have to think about differences amongst groups. And then I think what you have to do is think about what levers can be used. So one of the things I think when I think about health equity is how do we change some of the basic approaches based on the needs of both the individual, but also what we know about the context of the world they're probably living in. And where can we partner with other community organizations to have some impact? And where can we bring our dollars to the table to make a difference? I do want to talk about partnership because if I had to pick one theme that emerged through all of the conversations we've had, it would be partnership. But before we talk about partnership, you said a moment ago that that the payer's lens is a public health lens. I think a payer's lens can be a public health lens. I don't know that all payers think about it that way. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you, because w w do you think about it that way? From my point of view, and, and it may be that we have an advantage because we are part of a large academic medical center, we are a predominantly regional health plan, and I think one of the advantages of um, living in a community and serving a community is knowing what the support infrastructure of that community is knowing how to partner in appropriate ways. Has it been challenging to, or is it ever challenging, to try to keep a public health perspective at or close to the center of what we do? You know, I think that the balancing act is that um, there isn't enough money in the uh, narrow health care dollar um, to correct all of the needs attached to things that drive health outcomes. And there's certainly waste in the healthcare dollar, and there are ways that we're trying to use it much more effectively to improve health outcomes. But in terms of curing all ills, it's not going to be strictly out of a healthcare dollar. And I think part of what, what one has to do is recognize um, a public health orientation is critically important from the point of view of we have a responsibility for a population that we serve. And within that population, there are ways of thinking about making it better for all that are in our membership group to improve. And that kind of um, orientation, I think, should never go away. But what I do think is that you have to be able to be realistic about where dollars can be spent and what difference they will make and not use them foolishly. So that's where I think partnership becomes increasingly important because it's almost a braided funding construct, right? So if we can come to the table with, with a strategy that we're trying to deploy and we know that the primary care groups in a region are doing that and we know that the um, social services organizations in the community are also seeing a lot of the same people, how do we work together um, to align our dollars and align our interests. And I think that when you're willing to be that kind of a partner, you can um, facilitate things that can be uh, very important in a community. What are some of the partnerships that you're most excited about? So I'll start with a simple one. The problem is great. Um, and the solutions have not been easy to find. We know that we have a um, higher rate of uh, premature birth and infant mortality for African-American population in our region than our white population. What would it take to increase the odds that people can get earlier prenatal care 
and get continuity of care following the birth of a baby. And I think what it takes is a combination of people who are willing to sort of understand where people are coming from and what their needs are. So if our health plan partners with our OBGYN treatment services and collectively we create a doula system and can work with community-based services where we know that young mothers are often turning to get additional help and support for their children and their families. Um, I think you start to see a combination of the plan and the medical community and the service community based in a community that can start to make a difference to do a couple things. One is surround people with services, but also to become a little more culturally competent in terms of, well, what exactly is it that somebody thinks they need versus what we think they need. And also, how do we think about then, you know, building upon trust that may not be there always and that uh, sometimes can get in the way of very basic things like whether I will call a doctor if I think I'm in trouble. We also have been working with HUD on housing. And so one of the things that, that we've worked on for a very long time is working with some of the homeless services that are, that are in Pittsburgh, working to establish um, lower and more affordable uh, rent situations. And uh, as an example, we've recently um, launched a uh, housing initiative that will allow us to be a partner along with developers and other kinds of organizations in town that will begin to build and take advantage of some of the Section Section 8 um, vouchers that actually go to waste because there isn't an infrastructure to support their use. So I think there are just a myriad of examples of how you can think about ways to partner and bring your um, your strategies to the table. One of the things we did recently is gather together um, our social innovation work and try to uh, systematically think about our program intervention so that perhaps we can leverage more uh, of our of our work across housing, workforce, food instability, and the kinds of things that we know really do impact health. And the UPMC Center for Social Impact, which, as you mentioned, was established in December of 2019, and the conversations that that we've convened is such evidence of the commitment that's being made to take these problems head on. And there's been policy changes during the pandemic. It's accelerated policy changes that I think folks had been hoping for for a while, kind of forced our hand. And unlikely that we can go back to um, to way, the way things were before some of those policies were put in place. But from a policy perspective, what are things that you're feeling hopeful about with respect to perhaps recent policy changes or that you're hoping to see in the future? So, you know, you're right. Absolutely. I think that that during um, the during this COVID era, um, the fact that CMS changed the ability to pay for telehealth in sites that were not allowed before was a very big deal. And it's interesting because uh, when I look at, you know, our own system, which saw an enormous increase in the use by our health plan members, it was really quite an interesting uh, experiment, right? Because for many years, we've done telehealth. It's not a new thing. But there really was kind of this combination that patients slash members weren't necessarily 100% trusting of it. And physicians weren't so sure they wanted to change the way they delivered care. And I think what we suddenly saw is a lot of the things that were barriers, uh, quickly people overcame them. And so I think that that's a great example of how when um, push comes to shove, you can actually get something done very quickly. And, you know, it was a good opportunity to say, you know, never waste a crisis. The future of what potentially can happen from a policy perspective, in my mind, I'm hoping um, there's an increased consciousness about how significantly the differences in terms of who was impacted from the pandemic became so obvious. And if you look at, you know, we saw a lot of uh, deaths in uh, nursing homes, uh, group facilities. In some cases, um, we 
could learn from this dramatically, not just about infectious disease. We can also learn what is happening with older adult populations in our country and how are we thinking about the care and service and treatment for those people from a policy perspective going forward. When you look at the essential workers and you look at the disproportionate share of people who were of color uh, being impacted, the problems that we saw and the underlying health conditions that we saw emerged very rapidly. The access to care and service was very evident. And so I think part of what I'm hoping is part of where policy will go, and I think it's already going there, is a recognition that looking more broadly at what does health mean and what influences health. So we've got some bills at the federal level that are thinking about, well, how would we begin to pay for things that fall into the social, um, the, you know, the, the determinants of health? How do we think about the impact of housing? I know in our own state, our Medicaid program has been interested in working with the managed care companies, what, us, um, to try to figure out how would we partner more directly with non-health organizations that are really more in the social service space that would allow us to align that bridged funding kind of concept of integrating and surrounding people with services that will improve their health. So I think there's a lot of opportunity in this in the policy space, um, and I think that will probably evolve relatively quickly, I hope, because I think the needs are quite evident in the context of the pandemic and really a lot of the things that are happening nationwide in terms of social justice. I do have one more question. You've had a long career in health and healthcare, and you've had many different roles. And I am thinking about what it might be like to have worked for a long time on some of the same problems and how you think about or approach being consistent or being persistent and still having hope and seeking ways to be innovative and promote change, even while some of these challenges have, have also been very persistent? That's a good question. It's an interesting question. I think about that question. Oftentimes, because I have been around a while, you learn somewhere along the line that it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. But the other thing is one of my favorite Churchill quotes, which is never, never, never give up. And the reason I think that's important is because in some ways we are really fighting a war. And it will be like probably the history of the human race, which has been war-torn indefinitely. And what I think is that none of us are going to solve everything. But you know, if you show up and do your piece and a collective shows up and does their piece, that what you can build is being a catalyst. And you should probably be okay with that. So that's kind of where I sit on that. Thank you for sharing that. Is there anything else you would like to share with people listening about how we're approaching addressing social determinants and influencers of health. We are entering a new era. Much of what has to be done is, is sort of having the political will to do it. And finding the, the levers and the resources, I think they're there. I think the, the part of the problem is that we don't have much like-mindedness about what it is that we need to do and then figure out a way to incentivize getting it done. Um, the world is full of lots of examples of you get what you pay for. And so the combination of looking at payment model reform, policy reform, political will at a community level, and understanding that, um, that the future of our nation really depends upon the healthy generation of children that will grow up and be productive adults. And we can't afford to waste our children. So 
I think there's an opportunity to find like-minded people who are willing to try to push to a new way of thinking and doing, and that our understanding of the integration of traditional medical, great research that will help us with some new treatments and genetic innovation, uh, opportunity to look at sort of the social milieu and understand what does or doesn't help or make a difference, and really begin to build between that health equity and that social equity that is so important in our country. So, Diane, I want to thank you so much for being with us today on Good Health, Better World. It's really been a privilege to have your time and to hear your perspective. Thank you for your leadership and for your support of of this work. And for folks listening, if you'd like to learn more about any of the things that Diane Holder and I discussed today, there will be links in the show notes. Diane, thank you for being on Good Health, Better World. Well, thank you, Ellen. It's been terrific. Thank you for listening to Good Health, Better World, presented by UPMC Health Plan. Be sure to come back next time. 